Hello, everybody. Hi there. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure that uh, everyone can hear me, everyone can see me before I begin. Um, so if you can hear me and you can see me and you're watching me live, um, give me a little wave um, or write something in the comments so that I know that you are there. Um, if you are joining me on replay, then please do again, feel free to say hello. Um, and whilst we're waiting for, for people to find us, um, please do add into those comments, when did you, for your child, if they're sitting their exams in 2022, when did you start your practice papers? Please let me know. Let me know when you started them, because uh, it's going to help me a little bit as I go through today. Perfect. I can see that somebody uh, is hearing me um, and someone is is there. Um, hopefully you can all hear me and you can see me. Um, as I said, I'm going to wait just a couple of minutes to make sure that uh, everyone knows I'm here. Um, and indeed, I know that there are some of you who have already messaged me to say that you will be watching that replay. Um, so hello to you guys as well. Um, and I hope that everyone enjoys it, whether you're watching live or whether you are watching um, on the replay. But do feel free to please get involved. Um, let me know in the comments um, all about your practice papers. I'll be asking some questions um, in tonight's live, um, looking at things like where you are um, when you are um looking at uh practice papers what might be happening um and so uh so yes that should all be good what i'm going to very quickly do because i know that there is uh there that uh we're live in the group but we don't appear to be live in the event um so i'm just going to add the link so that people can see uh hopefully and uh can find us so let me just make sure that it's all there and then we'll be good to go so it should just be about one minute guys just whilst I sort that all out and then uh, and then we should be good all right so let me just technology is a wonderful thing <laughs> let me just see if I can add the link to where we are into the group so that nobody nobody gets left behind and everyone can find us there we are okie dokes all right so as i said i will be starting in one minute um if you are waiting for me to start please do let me know when did you start practice papers have you not started them yet are you looking online and seeing everybody say that they're started but they're not quite sure um so do let me know um, and uh, and let me know kind of where you are in your preparation process. Um, perfect. So we should be good to begin. All right. So hopefully, uh, if you're watching this, as I said on replay, uh, you have uh, you are able to to see me and to hear me. All right. Um, perfect. So a little bit of I suppose an introduction. Um, about me, um, I, I've worked as a private tutor for about 10 years. I'm a qualified teacher um, and now I run uh, the Education Hotel, which offers 11 plus tuition, which is part of the reason I'm here, and summer courses. Um, I also help students to find the right school uh, using an education consultancy. Um, I have been an admin here uh, on the 11 plus journey for a couple of years. And one of the big things that I really like doing is going live and talking to you guys through the screen um, and being able to give you some tips and tricks and, and see, you know, what you guys are feeling and hopefully add a little bit of value. So uh, so that's me. Um, sometimes you can find me. I speak. Um, I write for Families Magazine from occasion um, in the Telegraph, Guardian, etc. So typically found around education um, but uh, I also produce the wow words which come in the group um, so I suppose why why now why am I talking about papers now and I, I can see someone say you know I've not started papers yet and that's perfectly fine um, what I want to make sure is that everyone starts at a different point but kind of from February half term through Easter to now 
typically students start to move to full papers and lots and lots of people start to approach me and, and my team and they say we really want to focus on boosting our preparation and really really starting to uh to really focus in on those exam papers and one of the reasons that, uh, that that students start to go into papers is so that they can start to see how long a whole paper is. And it might be that uh, that your child is, is finishing off some syllabus bits. It might be that they have been doing parts of papers. So maybe short 10-minute uh, tests or even 20-minute tests or partway papers. Um, but now you're thinking... Maybe they need that exposure, that time to spend on a whole paper. But as I wanted to say, everybody is different. OK, so, so don't feel like, oh, I've seen Gemma do this talk. She said that we should do papers and so we should, because it depends on where you started and it depends on where you want to end up. If you're aiming for a really competitive school and you started several years ago, your journey is going to look very different to someone who started recently and maybe is aiming for a less competitive school. But we do get lots of people who start asking in the 11 plus journey about papers. And so that's why I'm running this talk. Um, but really, the importance of doing papers is something that I want to focus on. And as your student starts to finish the syllabus, exam papers, and, and whether that is mock, whether that is done at home, whether that's a postal, whether that's done in an exam hall, they've all got different kind of abilities, different things that might be able to help. OK, so they've got different ways of showing your student how they might be able to improve. So I can see that one person has been brave enough to tell me a little bit about how they're using papers. If you are watching this, do let me know in the comments. Um, have you started papers? Are you starting them soon? Have, if you've started them, how many of them have you done? Uh, do let me know and I can always respond. So um, there's four things that I really wanted to think about, which was kind of how to use these papers, practice papers, past papers. I use the terms interchangeably. Um, first is to highlight the areas that we need to be focusing on in revision. The second is to highlight the exam technique. And that's slightly different to the areas of revision. Um, third is really about highlighting what to do on the day. And fourth is about tracking your progress. And typically, these are questions that people come to me and ask. So I thought instead of uh, reaching out to me this year, what I can do is I can create this video and I can help more of you who might be able to, uh, to watch. So the first thing is really when you are marking a practice paper, I want you not to just give it a mark. And I know that that's frustrating. And it's really frustrating as a student to not necessarily get a mark back because that's all that we become focused on. I know that when I was at school and indeed when I was taking my university exams and my teacher training exams and when I was doing an essay, I wanted to know the mark straight away. I wasn't as interested in the feedback, but the feedback is really what helps you to improve. So don't just give it a mark. Don't just look at the mark and that's it. Really spend some time with your child going over that exam and looking over it and making sure and asking things like, you know, how did you work this out? Was it something that you rushed? Did you guess at it? Show me how you worked it out. Give them a, a whiteboard and a pen and ask them to show you physically. How did you work that out? Um, because then it allows you to be able to see what was going on in their head. And one of the big things about 11 plus grammar exams in particular is that they're multiple choice. So we can't always tell why a child has picked something. They could have made a mistake picking the letter. They could have worked it out and then got a copying error where you look at it and then you see a completely different number when you go to mark the answer. Um, it could be that they didn't know how to do it. And so they guessed it and it was a lucky guess. Or it could be that they eliminated, especially if they're doing something like nonverbal reasoning. Maybe they used a bit of elimination and they chose between two. And the, the second one was the incorrect one. You don't know that until you ask them, until you work with them. 
So do spend time going through these papers, reflecting on them, especially if you're doing them at home and you've got them and you've got that mark scheme. I appreciate that for some mock exams, um, there might be a point where you don't necessarily get the mark scheme back or you don't get the paper back. And they are useful again, but in different ways. So this is if you can see that practice paper. Um, <laughs> I always say down here, try doing it yourself, but I know that parents are, are sometimes a little bit worried. So if there's a question that you, your child has explained how they've done it and you're going, I can see how that worked, but it's not the right answer. Please do ask on the 11 plus journey because that's what people are here for. We're here to try and explain it. We're here to try and see you know, how we would have done it or how as tutors, maybe I would have taught something. And that can sometimes be a different method to what a child is using. Sometimes it can be a faster one. Sometimes it could be a, a way of speeding it up or making it more, uh, making it accurate and making sure they can check it. And using all these different alternative methods and using them as checks can really help them to be able to speed up, but also speed up accuracy, because accuracy is the thing we're really aiming for at this point. Um, keep the questions, keep the questions that your child has struggled with and then ask them again later. So um, take a, a screenshot if it's online or a photo if you've got a paper version and save them all somewhere so that in August, hopefully when you rewatch this video, um, you're going, oh, what did Gemma say? She said something about to do in August. But you can bring all those questions back out and you can put them in front of your child and you hopefully, if your child's worked on their technique, they should be uh, they should be getting more of those correct. And I do this. I do this even with my GCSE students. So my GCSE students are just about to start. Uh, one of them starts tomorrow. So what we've been doing is we've been going through past paper questions, not necessarily a whole past paper, but maybe chunks sometimes geographies tomorrow and it's a two hour paper um so we've been doing little bits and then what we'll do is if there's a question that's incorrect take that question and i'll put it in a spreadsheet it's got their name on it and then i've got this big long list of all of the things that they got incorrect and oddly for this student i i actually do the all of their gcses so um that's the reason that i'm doing geography i don't normally but uh, for this student i kind of mentor them through everything so it's worth keeping those questions and, and for you guys keep them somewhere online or keep them somewhere kind of at home and uh, then what you can do is you can make a whole paper out of things that you've done before and it's very unlikely especially in something like math verbal nonverbal, a little bit more so in english but it's unlikely that your child will notice they're the same questions if you've left it you know, we're in May now, we're talking August. So do make sure that uh, when you're doing those papers or question practices, you are taking the bits that you're interested in or the bits that your student's not scoring so well in and uh, you are, you're making sure that you're keeping those. So someone's asked a really great question um, about the regularity of papers. Do you do a paper every day? Ultimately, it depends on your child. So I know some parents who will, um, and I know some parents who really will do a couple of papers, uh, and that's it. Um, there are some advantages to, to doing it. There's some advantages to not. Uh, I'll take you through kind of the, the pros and the cons. Um, the, the pros of doing papers regularly and, and not necessarily every day, because I feel like every day would be would be quite a lot. Um, but if you're doing something like English, math, verbal and nonverbal, and you're rotating those, actually, it's, it's less intensive. But if you were to do something um, like a paper, maybe every other day, um, then what your child sees is they see lots of different uh, questions. And that means that they therefore get the exposure to a lot of different questions. The cons of that is that you probably aren't spending a lot of time going over those mistakes and it's going over the mistakes where it's really important. So what I would be doing would be using a paper to then direct that week's learning. So for me, when I work with students for 11 plus, we'll do a set of papers and that might be all four at the weekend. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll pick out those areas, the areas where it was maybe silly mistakes, the areas where it was not silly mistakes, and it was learning things. And I'll do extra questions on those. 
And that will mean that I'll go back through workbooks. I'll look through maybe Bond books or Galore or uh, First Past the Post, Schofield, whatever kind of books that, that uh, pick up on that topic. And I'll make sure that we've re-revised it. And then I'll make sure that we've done some practice questions because that reflection is more important than simply going through. Because if you just keep going on a paper, as you'll see a little bit later, um, it doesn't necessarily teach a lot. The importance is really on the review. So I would add the emphasis on the review as opposed to the regularity of doing the papers. Um, but there is definitely a, a kind of a, a worthwhile thing in terms of uh, talking about doing papers regularly. So I've got some kind of indicators that says that your child might need to focus on specific topics. So the first thing is if you're missing large amounts of that test paper, you know, your child sat down, first test paper that they're doing, and they have a large amount of it missing, big, big chunks. You need to go back to the basics. Um, either your child's really panicked, um, in which case you need to have a conversation with them. They need to get used to taking those papers. Or it says that your child is missing something and it's fairly large. So go back don't do any more past paper practice. It's going to stress you out. It's also going to stress your child out and work instead on making sure that maybe they can do it in smaller chunks and building up that time or that you're making sure that you've gone over the basics. It might just be it's the first time they're ever sitting down and doing a test. And that might be it. Or it might be that they aren't used to seeing questions in that particular format. And that's why I like to use different past test providers or practice paper providers, because that allows students to be able to see different types of formats. And we know that the 11 plus changes and sometimes it changes with less notice. So I like my students to be prepared and I like them to feel like they can go into that exam and they can say, I've done all these different types of questions. So I don't need to worry if something comes up that's slightly different. So that's part of that confidence building for me. So if large bounce of that test is incorrect or missing, go back to the basics. If there's smaller little bits, this is where I was saying that reteach and rerun. So pick out those areas where a student has struggled, reteach them, teach it maybe in a slightly different way. Come on to the uh, 11 plus journey. Ask us, you know, how would you tackle this question? See, is it different to the way that your child tackles it? If it is, go through a different or maybe an alternative method. Those alternative methods can sometimes really click. Maybe the first method didn't quite work for a student. This one, maybe it works. And so that is why it's worth going back, reteaching, run some mini tests, run some kind of five, 10 mark questions, short amounts, make sure they've got it. And that means that next time it comes up, they shouldn't make that same mistake again. Other things that you might want to do if you're looking at kind of smaller areas and they're continually getting those small areas wrong, but when they're doing the, the mini tests with you, they're getting them fine. It might be that they need reminding just before the exam. So it might mean that they always forget that there's 60 minutes in an hour and you find that they're continually over and over and over again, assuming the 100 instead of 60 rule. That's something that can easily be put up onto a poster and they can design that poster and they can stick it on their wall. And it's something that therefore is helping them revise it in a different way. So sometimes it's not just question practice that's going to make it better. Sometimes it's really doing something different. So typically it's easier to see that on math. Um, but the same thing happens with verbal, nonverbal. If they're really struggling with, co um, with cube questions, then it might mean that you need to teach cubes a different way. So if you were previously running through a set of rules um, and they're struggling to remember those rules, try it practically. If uh, they're, they're struggling with understanding it, practically try nets. So there's different ways of teaching so that they can, they can work out kind of what works. And when they're thinking, it's sitting there in the exam thinking about, OK, how do I do nets? They haven't just got one method. They've got lots and lots. Um, sometimes, sometimes you can do a paper and maybe your child's got like five to seven marks wrong and they all seem completely spread out. And you're thinking, well, how do I know what to focus on? 
That's why I'd say keep a spreadsheet or a log of those questions, because although you might not see it right away, you will see it as you start to go through them. And we've got a checklist. I can I can add it into the comments. I've put down here to remind myself to do that. Um, where what I do is I'll go along and I'll, I'll tick it off. So I'll say, oh, the, this exam had a, this type of question and this type of question and this type of question. And my student did really well on this and they struggled on this. And the next time that type of question comes up, I'll do the same thing. And then you can start to see patterns. So with, in, with math, it is typically you can mark it against a topic list. With English, again, there is a topic list. We've got a topic list for English, but you can further group those questions, word, meaning, inference, quotes, uh, nonverbal reasoning, verbal reasoning. There are categories. So you can get kind of 26 different types of question and you can see where is it that my child typically struggles. So those are some of the things that are worth looking at. This is a kind of typical question that I know people often come to me with. They say, oh, but Gemma, my child's scoring really well. They're getting 80s, 90 percent on this publisher, but not on this publisher. So the moment they start this type of publisher, they go down. And I go, great, <laughs> because that is that's that's kind of the joy of of having different publishers because it's about being able to use different types of question and often they will dip as they go on to a different publisher and that might be because the questions are trickier and some of the publishers are trickier than others um but it also might be because they're seeing a different style of question so typically when when i work i work a lot with uh, competitive or super selective schools um, and I will use lots and lots of publishers because I want my children to my children my students to see um, different types of questions and that means they're not phased they're not phased on the the real thing and typically I'll move them as I said from from really short 10 minute tests to maybe 20 minutes and sometimes if I can't find a 20 minute I'll just put two 10 minutes together or I'll cut a real thing I'll cut a real thing in three and then I'll give them those different bits and I'll see how they do on each one so don't be afraid to to maybe change the style or change the the ordering if you've got so you've got a 45 minute amazing slot where your child can sit down really focused on a Saturday morning but your papers are an hour and the papers that you've got they're, they're an hour long don't be afraid to take a bit out and you can always combine those and form a later paper so don't feel like you're you're stuck because you've got that that specific format that it has to sit with because ultimately different publishers have different formats okay and then we've got things that happen with not finishing and things that happen with finishing quickly so i know that some of you will be watching this going oh, my child rushes through but if your child is not finishing there's probably a couple of reasons. Uh, lack of understanding, and we'll see that because a whole subsection has been missed or is incorrect. Um, lack of stamina. Typically, you see a really great work up until kind of like three quarters of the way, and then it just doesn't go so well. Um, that tells us that usually your child is really great at focusing, but they run out of energy and they run out of stamina. And that is a test taking thing. They need to be able to um, focus for, for that long or keep the, keep the energy up for that long. So that is practice. That's practice of doing slightly longer tasks. That is really practicing. Um, maybe taking a mini break in the middle if they're really struggling. Um, and for my students, a mini break uh, looks, looks kind of similar to often we do it when we're stressed um so we put our pens down put our palms on the table look up look down deep breath release pick our pen up and it takes less than a minute um but that sometimes can be a bit of a reset and often what i'll say to a student is you're taking two tests back to back and you're going to mark where the first half is and you're going to take that mini break and that sometimes helps with the stamina um you can notice sometimes if your child has a lack of focus, they have a lack of focus, they're, you know, looking out the window, twiddling the hair, you know, taking a lot of water, um, playing with the cap on the water, doodling. 
you'll find that that is, is a focus issue. Um, and that is, again, it's it's about being able to take those exams and having the maturity to take those exams and being able to sit there and know what you need to do. And sometimes that is it's a harder um, thing to, to do because uh, we've got students of different kind of ages and different maturity levels. So often with that lack of focus, it is about making sure that you can break it up for them so that they know exactly where they need to be at certain times. So if they're a kind of competitive, but maybe they haven't got that focus, you can make sure that they are aiming for certain things, they're aiming for certain marks or certain timings that can help with that focus a little bit. And ultimately, and this is a warning, there, everyone finds test taking stressful. So there will be a point where your child will likely cry or panic and they won't finish. And that's, that's fine because that is a lesson on how we get ourselves out of panic. Because so many times, and I work with students full time, sometimes I'll live with them um, when I'm helping students for really highly selective independence. Um, if I'm working with expats or people who are international, I might uh, spend a, a long time with them. And I, I have students who will cry um, or will panic when they're taking an exam. And it happens in mocks too. It happens in mock exams. You get a student who will just completely panic it. Um, and and whilst nothing can be done at that time, there is something to be done afterwards. And it is about working out how can your child deal with that panic? How can they recognize that that panic is starting and get themselves out of it? Because it will likely be that if they look at that paper when they're calm, they'll be fine. It's just that they've gotten themselves into that mental state where they're panicking and they can't see anything about it. So you really want when when that happens, if that happens, you want to work with your child to make sure that they can overcome that panic. So one of the things that I do with my students is if they feel that panic, first of all, they do the breathing exercises that we work with and we've got a number of them that we use. Um, then they might do a bit of visualization. Again, I work with them on that. And then if if they're really struggling and they're really feeling that panic, they go to the bathroom. They look at themselves in the mirror. They tell themselves that they can do it. They splash their face with water and they go back in and they start again. And that is a routine that they have learnt because they have panicked before and they've been unable to continue. So that is something that I work with students on as well. And, and it's all those kind of little exam techniques that you're working through as you're looking at these papers. Um, finishing too quickly, uh, again, it can show a lack of understanding because it means your child has just skipped a whole section. Again, it can show a lack of stamina. It means that your child just wants to finish and be done and they throw their pen on, down on the floor and they go, that's it, I'm done and I don't want to do it again. Um, and that means that they're not checking, typically. So these are often the students who are rushing, rushing, rush, 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 and they've made a whole load of silly mistakes often um if you get a run of several questions wrong often especially in nonverbal, i find this happens they spent a really long time on the first one and then they panicked and then they rushed everything afterwards and you can really really clearly see this um both in the the grammar and in something like the i said pretest um i do a lot of i said pretest with my students um i use uh, often exam paper pluses um online system and i can see a whole row of questions where they they've rushed and i'll sit down with them and i'll take those questions again 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 um and i will work with them and i'll give them to them in a different setting and they'll be fine and it's because I've taken the first one away and I'll say to them, right, we need a, we need a technique. And, and when I talk about exam techniques, I was just ask, I'm talking about how a student takes an exam rather than what they need to know to take an exam. So you might have all the knowledge, but when you sit down to do an exam, how are you making sure that all of your marks are, are marks that you, you have focused on and you might know it, but how can you make sure that you're making the right decisions in the exam? So if you're panicking, how can you get yourself out of it? If you need to check your work, checking is one of those big things that, that we, uh, we teach and, and we work on for so long um, because so many students 
don't see the difference between looking to see if I marked an answer and checking. Um, seeing that run of several questions and saying, okay, that probably means that you panicked on the first one or you spent ages on the first one and then you rushed. How are we going to deal with that? That's what I talk about when I talk about exam technique, not do I know codes questions or do I know times tables? It's more do I know how to do the exam? OK, um, typical question that comes up and I know it comes up because people reach out to me and they ask ask me and, and I love it when people reach out to me and ask me. So please do. Um, but uh, but often um, sometimes I redirect you back here. So if you if you've been redirected to this video and it's uh, it's a recording, this is the reason I've probably redirected you. Um, you've probably got a hold of me and said, my child's really struggling. Do we just keep doing more tests? Um, no is the answer because your child is not going to miraculously get better um what you're doing is probably denting their confidence and probably stressing yourselves out and if you look at it you know if your your car broke down at the end of every road would you keep driving it no you'd stop you'd do a service you'd get somebody in you would work on it and then you would do it again so think of that when your child is taking exams there's a reason the reason behind why they may not have gotten the score that you were hoping for and work on the reason, not necessarily on the score. OK, I know that somebody in the comments has asked about mocks and this is uh, this is the part. So is the mock exam online or classroom test per preferable? Oh, perfect. I'm about to answer that question. Um, which months can they started and how many? OK, so this is kind of what this section is all about. Um, mock exams, it's really important that your child knows why you're doing them. And it might be obvious to parents. They might say, well, of course, they know why I'm doing them. It's a mock exam. But um, but really, the 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 reason that you're doing them might not be to check their knowledge. It might be so they get the chance to do it in an environment with other students alongside timing or with other adults. So you make sure that they know the reason that that's there. Um, because the the point of doing an, a mock exam might not be to look at your scores. It might well be. And I know that there are tutors and, and exam providers and um, there are parents I know who are, who are quite vocal on um, 11 plus journey who did mock exams. And and I know that their, their children didn't do very well, but it was a great learning experience because it helped them to figure out, OK, what would you do if you panic? What would you do if this happened? And actually, that can be really useful. So make sure it is clear to your child. Um. Mock exam and how is it different to kind of practice papers or maybe postal and, and online mocks? Um, and it is worth saying at this point, I am going to mention I run a summer course. It has mock exams in it. So just as a kind of blanket. Um, so face to face mocks, face to face mocks can really help students to understand what taking that test is like They're physically there. What, how does it feel? when everyone else is taking the test and they're all rustling their papers and they're all going through it quicker than you, can you stay on task? Can you focus with all of that happening? Because actually that in itself is a skill. That's, a, that's kind of a technique. So, you know, what do you do when these things happen can often be helped with a face-to-face -face mock. Because that face-to-face -face mock is about trying to simulate the conditions that your child will be in when it comes to that, that day. But that's not to say an online or a postal mock can't add value. And we've got online mock exams. And, and one of the things that we introduced this year for our more intensive summer courses is an online mock. And the reason that we did that was a mock exam or a practice paper can help sit us as tutors or parents to see, are the students using the techniques that you've been teaching? No. If you've designed that paper and you know what you've taught beforehand and you know that that is something where a student typically doesn't doesn't get it right, can you see if they're using that technique? It allows you to objectively mark. And I know that I've been there when I've been marking a student's 11 plus paper and typically in English or a longer mark question. 
um, not necessarily an, an A, B, C, D. And they've they've yeah, not quite met the mark scheme, but but maybe. And also in creative writing, it can be really hard to be objective when there's no other people to to mark them against. So that can be a real useful help. Um, ranking. Ultimately, whilst a lot of people ask us about scores, you know, what score should my child be um, achieving? Ultimately, it's about their ranking. It's not about their, it's not necessarily about their score. Whilst their score will help on their ranking, um, the, the best you can do is being at the top of the ranking. So doing it alongside other children and being marked alongside other children therefore allows you to see where is a child coming within that ranking also how closely packed are they in that ranking so is it that uh, that your child came fifth but actually there was only two marks between them and the child who came first um, in which case that's an easy fix so really looking at, at kind of how that child might perform um, can be done with an online or a postal um, mock as well so there are different reasons why you might choose to do certain mocks. And I know that some people choose to do many and some people choose to do few. Um, and ultimately, it, I would say think about the reason that you're doing them and make sure that that reason is really clear to your child. Because if they're doing lots and lots of mocks and they don't know why and often they're just getting marks given back to them, it really doesn't help for confidence and it doesn't help for understanding because you feel like I'm just doing another one, another one, another one. Um, and and sometimes you, I see children who go to many, many mocks and who every weekend is a mock exam. And and they say to me, they say, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, this score doesn't matter because I've got another one the next weekend. And you want to, to think about the message that you're sending to your child about doing those mock exams. Tracking progress, and I'm I'm almost done. Um, I think uh, I probably talked for longer than I should have. I get quite enthusiastic about these topics, so uh, I do do keep uh, keep talking. And um, one of the things I really like is using a traffic light system, and it really helps my students to be able to see where they're getting things right, where they might need to work on, and where is a little bit variable. And often it's the variable that my students really notice. They know what they need to work on. They know what they're good at. But sometimes I'll say to them, oh, this is an orange topic. Oh, no, 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 it's not. I get everything right in it. And then I can prove to them. I can say, oh, no, this one was wrong and this one was wrong. Why was that? Oh, I wasn't paying attention or, oh, I was doing this. And then we work on it. And we work mainly on the reds and the oranges. And we work on alternative ways to solve them or ways to check them or ways to make sure they're more accurate. All of those kind of reteaching, revising stuff and making sure that there is that revision of knowledge as opposed to just testing. Um, calling out the mistakes, but not where. So telling your child you've made four mistakes in this paper, but not telling them where, because that means that then you're seeing how long does it take them to go back and check that work? You're not giving them any guidance. You're not saying it's on question number 19. Question number 20. You're just saying to them, there are four mistakes and see how long it takes them to recognize those mistakes. Do they recognize those mistakes? Because that helps us learn about checking. And checking is one of the most important things in terms of increasing percentage. When someone comes to me and they say, I've got, you know, I've, I've, I've got a student who is doing maybe 65 percent. What is the biggest thing that's going to get them higher? It's going to be checking. Is going to be that they are making probably lots of silly mistakes. They probably don't know some topics, but if they can start thoroughly checking and they know how to check, it is a skill, um, then, then you can start to see those marks improve. And as I've said before, it's absolutely fine to rerun a paper or to take questions from a few papers. It's also a great way to boost your child's confidence. So Typically, um, if you're looking towards the end of the, the kind of practice time and you're looking, you know, just just kind of end of summer and you're thinking, how can I make sure that my child's confidence is really high? Because walking in there, knowing that they know what they're doing, that's something I really want. Then do try and dig out maybe some of those questions that uh, that that are ones that they are comfortable with and mix in some of the ones that they're not so comfortable with and try them on a paper of, of kind of what's we 
pre-seen stuff, they would have forgotten it by then, um, especially if it started really early. So um, so do, do make sure that that's uh, something that you can do. And as I've said, confidence. So test papers should be there to stretch and challenge, but they have a role in reassurance. For a student to be able to walk into the exam confident, they need to believe in themselves. They need to know that you believe in them. And one of the ways that they can do this is by seeing the marks increase in a paper. So if you are looking to really push your child, consider when you're adding those most difficult of papers, because you would not want to damage their confidence just before they go into an exam. So do you think about confidence and confidence is something I think is really important when we're talking about students. Um, so that kind of leads me on to the, the last part, which is a little bit of uh, a little bit of a pitch, which is that obviously the education hotel has summer courses. Um, one of the things that they focus on is confidence um, and uh, we're running them throughout summer. And we do a three week and that includes mock exams. We also do a one week and that one week is focusing on creative writing or English or math or nonverbal or verbal reasoning, allowing you to choose what you would like. Um, if you have further questions about that, please do reach out to me. I'll put my details in the chat. Um, and if you've got any other questions and you're watching this either on replay or you're watching it on live and thinking, Gemma has not answered the question that I really want to know, please do add those questions in the comments. I always go through the comments. I love to read the comments once I'm finished. Um, and sometimes when I'm, when I'm in, the, uh, in, the, in the live as well, um, I won't forget the checklist. I will make sure I pop it down. Um, but thank you everyone for listening, whether you're listening live or on replay. Um, as I said, I am Gemma. I am from the Education Hotel and I uh, have loved speaking with you this evening. Um, so thank you ever so much for joining. And uh, I think that's probably it from me this evening. Um, you've probably also had enough of my speaking. So you are probably ready to close the screen and, uh, and let me go. Um, I will, will stick around in the comments. Um, I, after probably I'll go to grab some have some dinner or something but um if you do have any questions pop them in the comments i'll make sure that i get back to you um and i will uh, i will wish you all good night um and uh, hopefully you found it enjoyable you found it useful um thank you ever so much for attending all right then bye bye <laughs>